Good afternoon and welcome to the State of North Carolina Agency Meet and Greet Series. My name is Andrea Bennett and I lead a program called Ed to NC operated through the North Carolina Office of State Human Resources. The main goal of this program is to excite, motivate, and encourage college students, alumni, and early career professionals into rewarding careers in state government. Thank you all for joining us here today for this is day three of our series with the NC Department of Information to of technology. Before I hand it over to DIT, I have a few announcements. At the end of this meeting, I will, send, I will be sending out a link to a very short survey and a follow-up email. Please take the time and complete it and give us your feedback. Also, if you are interested in registering for another session later this week or next week, I will provide that link in the email as well. Besides that, if you have any questions during the course of this presentation, please feel free to use the chat unless otherwise noted by our presenter. Without further ado, the Department of Information Technology. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, so my name is Sean Osborne. I'm the Recruitment Program Manager for NCDIT, uh, Department of Information Technology. And I've been with DIT for the last couple of years. Uh, prior to that, I was at DHHS uh, for roughly five years. Um, so I think one of the first things I'm going to go over is that, you know, there's various benefits to working for the state and uh, you don't often just stick with one agency. So you may come come in with one agency and you know, move around. Uh, so I came to DHHS uh, and now I'm at DIT. Um, I'm not sure if this will be my final um, landing place, but uh, there's a lot of great agencies out there. So I'm going to cover uh, a little bit on all the agencies um, before I get into why it's good to work for DIT. So um, prior to that, I worked for, for IBM in various HR roles, and I've been focused in recruitment since I came to the state. Um, so I came and actually started just a recruiting coordinator and then moved my way up to recruitment program manager for all of DIT. Um, so I'm gonna take my uh, face off of here so I can focus on the content and um, I'll talk through everything uh, that I have. Hold on one second. So, like I said, I'm going to go over uh, why join the state. Um, so, the first thing I, I want to say is that um, we're actually the largest workforce across uh, the state. And there's a lot of mobility um, whenever you work for the state. Um, there's plenty of opportunities across the state, um, whether you're in, interested in IT or in other areas. Um, and you may even start in, a D in DIT or some other agency in a non-IT role, get your foot in the door, and then uh, you know get a certification, go through some boot camp, uh, go back to school, you know finish your degree, whatever, and you may end up um, coming to work for us. It's a little bit easier once you're already at the state to find another opportunity, but um, we're definitely interested in people outside of um, state agencies as well. Um, one of the big advantages to working for the state is that you're part of a greater cause. You know, you're serving the citizens of North Carolina. So if you're looking to make a difference and be a part of a positive impact in North Carolina, uh, you really should look into um, working for the state. Um, also, there's work-life balance. We have uh, a ton of remote work opportunities. I don't think every agency has as many remote work opportunities as we do at NCDIT, but um, like for instance, revenue, they may uh, be mostly in, in the office because of the types of systems that they work on um, because of their working with the tax system. But um, at DIT, we have 60% of our workforce is fully remote right now. And about, you know, the rest of that 40% um, is partial remote mostly. There's some people that have to work in in the building um, if maybe they're working on the data center, um, which is uh, actually in Raleigh. Uh, well, the Eastern data center is in Raleigh. The Western data center is out west, obviously. Um, or maybe the 911 center. So some of the people who work for the 911 center, which I'll go over a little bit later, they work, um, they have to work in, in the uh, building because they need to support um, that that service. That's a 24-7 service, obviously. So it's really important that people need to work there. But the majority of people that we work with at least are partially, and a lot of them are fully remote. 
Um, and we have realistic hours. We have eight weeks of paid parental leave, 12 holidays a year, 14 vacation days a year, 12 sick days, and we also have opportunities to do community service leave. Um, and because you know, you're working for the state, um, hopefully you're looking to work for the state because you're trying to give back. Um, we also want you to give back to, in other ways as well uh, through community service leave. Um, lastly, uh, about the state is that we have a comprehensive state health plan and we have an employee assistance program, especially during COVID. We had um, a lot of people that were struggling uh, mentally um, because of COVID and because of, you know, immediately going to work from home or um, because they were always around their family <laughs> um, or various reasons, you know. Um, we have an employee assistance program to help people like that. And we've always had that, um, but it, it definitely was used a lot more during uh, COVID. And then, uh, of course, we have longevity pay. You work for the state long enough, you get longevity pay, and we have retirement as well. So why join NCDIT? Um, you may have seen uh, this slide um, before because we provided this to, uh, to NC, to Andrea. But uh, essentially what we're trying to point out here is that uh, we have a mission we're trying to promote a stronger North Carolina that connects customers, residents, businesses, education, and government. And we're the leading provider of IT services to the state um, agencies, local governments, and educational institutions across North Carolina. DIT has 1,500 employees, roughly, uh, which includes contractors. And we also have what are called optimized agencies, which are uh, IT professionals working for other agencies, but they're actually under our umbrella. So uh, Andrea works for OSHR. Um, a, a lot of their IT people are actually under our umbrella. Um, the other agencies that are currently optimized are Department of Administration, Environmental Quality, Military and Veterans Affairs, Natural Cultural Resources, Budget and Management, Public Safety, Transportation, and uh, like I said, State Human Resources. Public Safety and Transportation are two of the three biggest agencies in the state, along with DHHS, uh, which is Health and Human Services, where I came from. Um, so all of their uh, IT people pretty much are over under our umbrella now. And transportation is actually makes up a third of our employees. Um, they're that big. They have, uh, I think we have roughly 500 employees that have moved from transportation under our umbrella. But, um, you know, we support all of those uh, agencies, including uh, agencies that are not optimized. And we have uh, jobs in areas such as broadband and connectivity, cybersecurity, risk and privacy, uh, data analytics. Uh, we have the Government Data Analytics Center, which is called GDAC. We provide the COVID-19 dashboards. Um, you know, we try to leverage our data assets for stuff like that. We have IT procurement uh, for the state. We have networking and telecom jobs as well. Uh, we have, uh, we. We control the health information exchange. So we're actually connected to 6,000 plus healthcare facilities. We have uh, hosting and cloud for uh, 60 agencies. Uh, we provide authentication services like NCID, which is North Carolina ID, for 1.4 million state employees and North Carolina residents and citizens. And then we have over 100 uh, projects under our IT project management umbrella. Uh, on this slide, there are certain degrees that were preferred. Um, of course, we couldn't fit everything on here. We um, There's qu quite a bit more, I'm sure. Uh, there's various skills on here as well and um, various entry level positions and professional career paths. But like I said, we, we cover um, anything that's really IT related, um, except for maybe AI, um, maybe some, I don't know how deep we are into machine learning. Those are really the only two things that you would consider IT that we really don't have a, a big foothold in. So if you're uh, interested in IT, um, we're the way to go. This is our uh, strategic plan. Um, and essentially, you know, I covered some of this. Um, our big priorities are expanding broadband. We got over a billion dollars to expand broadband to areas around the um, state that didn't previously have broadband, uh, especially like in rural areas. And cybersecurity and privacy is a huge, huge focus uh, for us. 
I, th I was on a call yesterday where they said that uh, across the nation, there's over 500,000 jobs in cybersecurity that are vacant. So if you're inter still interested in uh, going a cybersecurity route or maybe you finish a degree and you go back, um, that's a great route to go. It's kind of like if you want to um, never worry about having a job, you know, become a nurse. <laughs> um, you should also stick with cybersecurity and, and most other IT jobs unless you're looking at working on uh, like a mainframe, um, which is you know, everything is kind of moving to cloud. Um, you can uh, take a look at the rest of this and I'll, I'll try to put together a PDF so I can um, give it to Andrea so she can provide it to everybody afterwards. Um, and also this is online, um, but this is uh, kind of what we're focused on uh, in IT. Um, so like I said, we own the 911 sy system. Um, we serve on the statewide IT strategy board. We support other agencies, universities, community colleges, and other orgs across the state. And um, I think I covered kind of everything that we're really uh, involved in. Uh, I think the one thing I didn't talk talk about was cloud migration. So um, a lot of areas are trying to migrate to cloud, and it's not as easy as you would think uh, moving to cloud, and it's not always a, um, a cost saving. So you kind of need um, somebody to assist you uh, with doing that. As a business that's trying to move to cloud, um, if you just kind of put everything into cloud, it's not gonna actually save you money. Um, you need to make sure that you are uh, paying on demand. Um, so trying to figure out uh, when you need um, the various data that you're trying to access and paying it for, for it that way. Um, if you're just trying to access everything like you were before, you're gonna actually lose money. So um, we, that's one of our big focuses. Uh, the other thing I want to say is like, let's say that you do want to work for DIT. Um, there's various ways that you should be focused on trying to sell yourself and connect your experience to the job. One of the things that we always struggle with is people will apply to our jobs and it won't really be evident that uh, their experience connects or their education um, ex it connects to our jobs. Um, so this next section is going to be kind of about how you can find a Find a job that we've posted and uh, actually um, represent yourself uh, as positively as possible so that we you'll get through the screening process and you actually get in front of a hiring manager. Otherwise, you may not, you know, you may apply to a million jobs and not get anywhere. So the first section about this is like, how do you sell yourself? And then the next section will be about what kind of words to use um, that will be helpful. So whenever you go to um, look for our jobs, um, there's various sections um, to our jobs. There's always a about the position, there's a duty section, um, and there's about the org, and then they get into what are the requirements of the role, uh, which is knowledge, skills, and abilities. And there generally are management preferences sometimes um, in that same section. Those aren't required. Um, they're just gonna put you at the top of the pile um, whenever the hiring manager is actually looking at you. And then the minimum education experience uh, requirements, those are actually related to the classification. So let's say you're um, in a user support analyst role, um, you're going to have a different requirements for the role um, that require a certain amount of education, certain amount of experience and versus like some other classification. And then very specific things for um, that particular role because you may be in a user support analyst role and you're actually, um, your working title is very different um, because you're working on something very specific. So um, those uh, are very specific knowledge, skills, and abilities. So we want you to make sure that whenever you're filling out your application, that you're kind of tying everything in to what's listed on this application. And in order to do that, um, you really need to connect um, what's listed on there to your duties and um, I'm going to get into that in a minute. So uh, whenever you actually like, I don't know if you, any of you have ever, ever applied to a job at the state. Once you apply, though, uh, you'll have an application that you can clone going forward. But you want to make sure that um, 
whenever you apply to another job that you're making sure that things aren't being pulled in that need to be changed. Um, and it may not be specific to this role. We always tell people that you need to be tailoring your application to the role because that's how you get through the door. Um, the things that really you need to focus on whenever you're, if you are uh, repeating a, an application, you need to look at the minimum compensation. Um, a lot of people put it minimum compensation for one role, but it actually um, will kind of knock you out if you go to another role, which doesn't doesn't have enough money to pay for that particular role. You need to look at the highest level of education that's required for the role. Um, you may need to change your contact information if you haven't applied for something in a couple of years. Um, a lot of people, they will apply to something before they finish their degree and then they graduate. And if we look at it and we see that they haven't finished their degree, we're not going to be able to use that to qualify them for a role um, or get them more money. So you want to make sure that that's updated. It's a big, big deal. And then, of course, objective and then make sure your dates are um, are current. If you have previous positions, um, but you haven't updated the dates, uh, it may look like you have a gap in your employment or it may look like you are no longer working there. Um, and then that can also hurt you when you're trying to qualify for a job. Um, you want to be able to connect your experience to the job, like I said. And uh, this is a good example of what our knowledge, skills, and ability section looks like, as well as the minimum education experience requirements. Um, and you can see that everything that's kind of uh, circled in this yellowish orange color, that's the stuff that's not required. Um, for the majority of jobs you apply to at the state, uh, resume is not acceptable. So you definitely need to fill out your application. Some people will put C resume on uh, all their duties and then they'll never get through uh, because we can only accept an application and uh, resumes often like detail as well so um, you can always attach it as complimentary um, or supplemental but um, we're really looking at what you filled out on your application you always want to make sure you give us more detail than than less detail um, because it's going to help us uh, really qualify you and like I said, the KSAs are required, so you need to make sure you're demonstrating that you meet all of those KSAs. Otherwise, you're not going to be referred. Um, you're never going to be hired. Um, because they're requirements, it means that they're all required. So if there's five listed on there, you need to make sure that you meet all five. So at some point on your application, you need to have something connected, um, you know, visibly to that particular KSA. Um, so, like I said, each role doesn't have to include all the KSAs, but your application as a whole should show that all of the KSAs are met. You know, one thing you, you some people, um, especially people that are actually uh, working for the state, they think that everybody that uh, is a recruiter will understand um, whatever they put on their application that's implied. Um, so they think that everybody understands what kind of role they're, they're actually doing. And that's definitely not true. Um, recruiters are typically general recruiters, so uh, you need to help them out as much as possible um, to connect all of your duties to the role. Um, and the hiring manager as well, they may be in a management role, but not super technical. So you need to make sure that your titles or duties um, are really clearly connected um, to what it's saying. Um, so go off more detail. Um, that's that's really the biggest thing you want to do and try to use some of the same language too. Um, that will help. Um, there's another section for supplemental questions. Um, this is where you're going to answer to complement your duties listed in your application. And you also always want to think from a marketing perspective, like how can I market myself? Um, you also want to answer in depth and you think about from a selling standpoint, how are you going to focus on your strengths? Um, you want to make sure that you proofread your application as much as possible. You wouldn't believe how many people send us applications with a ton of misspellings, even in their job titles. <laughs> so it, it doesn't look, uh, you know, well. Um, it doesn't look very good for somebody when they they don't. It you know it shows a lack of uh, attention to detail when they don't proofread their application before they submit it, especially with their uh, their job titles. 
or maybe the company they're working for. If they spell um, <laughs> if they spell IBM wrong, I IMB or something, uh, it's kind of crazy. So I have seen that before. And you want to make sure that um, you're not falsifying anything because if you do get a job, we find out that you have entered something in here that actually isn't true. Um, you can definitely lose that job. Um, you know, everybody embellishes a little, but you don't want to outright falsify um, because you may not be uh, hired ever. Uh, you may get blacklisted. Um, and I talked about buzzwords and action verbs. Um, the best thing you should do is uh, do your research on the particular agency that you're applying to. So do your research on us, on DIT. Look at what we consider our vision, mission, and values. Um, you also want to look at what are the popular skills for this particular job um, in the industry. You need to look at that keywords like I talked about with um, the job, whether it's up in the, the first part of the job posting that talks kind of about what the job is about, or it may be in the KSA section, knowledge, skills, and abilities where you want to connect um, the same keywords that are in those sections. Uh, we don't actually do any keyword filters on um, on jobs like some private companies may. We're actually looking at all of these applications um, and maybe some people don't realize that, but the keywords are actually going to help you when we can connect the keywords that you use um, to the keywords that are in the posting. Um, and also, like I said, the recruiter may not understand all the buzzwords and jargon that are part of the particular industry. Um, and sometimes the hiring managers don't either. If they're not too super technical, maybe they're really in a management role or because they're in a management role, they've been separated from some of the technical side of the things uh, for a little bit. And everything changes so fast in IT anyway. Um, you want to make sure that you're spelling things out um, and you're really connecting what we're actually trying to get out of you. Um, so like here's an example of the vision, mission, values for NCDIT. So um, these are some of the things that um, you should see that are really important to us and then make them a part of your application. Um, and here's um, some more examples of like how to do that. So technical writing, project lifecycle, software development lifecycle, project management tools, Microsoft Office, SharePoint, these are all things I would consider keywords um, that you need to be pointing out on your application. Um, and then connecting to the industry. So these are various things that um, you may want to point out that are in the industry um, that are kind of surrounding these things that are on the application. And then uh, there are certain things that you can do. Um, you can look up this actually online figure out some of the, the words that you're using and maybe there's better better words. Um, so um, you want to make sure you're using action verbs. Um, you don't want to be very passive on your application. You want to look for active, um, active tense for everything. And you want to make it um, so that it's diversifying, strengthening, strengthening and individualizing your application, uh, making you stand out essentially. That's really what you're trying to do. You want to make them more dynamic and um, you want to try to grab our eyes and especially the hiring manager's eyes. Um, it's also helpful to be more clear uh, on what you're putting in. Uh, to recap, you know, what we're trying to help you do is stand out um, by connecting your skills and experience to what's required in the role that you're applying to. If you do your own research and understand what's required in applying for state roles and you think about who's going to be reading your application, a recruiter or a hiring manager and trying to decipher it. If you spend just a little extra time, it takes to proofread and or make sure that you're not inheriting bad or old information from old applications. You're going to be that much closer to getting referred to the hiring manager and standing out as one of the strongest candidates. So I'm not sure if there are any um, career advisors on the call or if it's just students, but we are interested in partnering um, with you. Plus, we're planning on um, or we actually are actively developing a robust internship program, and we're currently soliciting proposal internally uh, for the coming year. So if you, um, as a um, either a career advisor, if you have a lot of people, or if you're just a student, um, you can send me your resume, and we can certainly keep you in our database, and we can reach out as opportunities become available. If you're looking for internships, that, you know, if, if you're looking for a permanent job, 
um, you may want to just look for our vacancies, which are on governmentjobs.com. And uh, whenever you go to government jobs, you can always uh, narrow down to particular agencies um, and you can look at what jobs are being posted just for DIT, or you can look at it for the from the perspective of the whole state. You can also set up uh, reminders um, or not reminders like alerts. Um, there's something called job alerts. Um, whenever you first create a profile um, in government jobs, you can set up job alerts for various um, criteria that you set. So like I think there's like three or four um, that are related to IT. Um, you can choose those and then whenever jobs get posted that are related to those, then uh, you're going to get an email um, saying that those jobs have been posted that match your criteria. So um, you can either look for jobs when they come up, set up job alerts so that you always get an email so you're always aware, um, or you can send me your email um, and we'll keep you in mind for an internship. And then we're, we plan on um, posting our internships when we do have them. And it's not like we're only going to be posting them for the summer. We're only going to be posting them for the year. Um, or we're only going to be posting them for like, you know, January or December or whatever. It's not a particular date. Uh, when we start posting them, um, we're planning on posting them on a regular basis. So just keep a lookout and um, hopefully you can get a job with us uh, or with someone else in the state. Um, so. Do you, does anyone have any questions? That's all I had to present. Thank you so much, Sean. Yes, there were a few questions in the chat, but, and, but I'm going to give you a heads up. I was putting some links in the chat um, for you while you were talking. I did put in a um, a link to our job board, and and forgive me, everyone. The first link I I attempted the first link to be a filtered DIT, but don't use that link. Um, the last one is the filtered one of all the active roles for DIT. And then the second one was the link to create the job alerts, the one that um, Sean was making reference to. Of uh, Once you select whatever career categories, you will receive an email every time a position opens up. I believe for up to 12 months, you will, you will receive an email every time a position opens up um, within that category that you select during that alert. Uh, the first question, I don't know if you see the chat, Sean, uh, it's coming from uh, Naomi. It says, do you accept OPT optional practical training status for international students after they graduate? And would they be able to offer visa sponsorship once OPT is expired? So unfortunately, we don't sponsor uh, visas. Um, one of the, I think, issues that we we have with that is that uh, whenever you sponsor somebody, you take responsibility for them. Uh, it's not only expensive, but you also have to take responsibility for them. So um, I think in the past um, we haven't been able to do that. Um, it's too much of a financial risk for us. Um, but we do um, have people on uh, work visas. We just can't sponsor the visa. I'm not sure about the optional practical training. Um, that's a new new phrase for me. I'll have to take that back. Thank you let, so much. Let you know or let them know. Okay, thank you. And there's another question, and you, you did touch on this a little bit, so maybe you can add more detail, because because you did mention that, uh, which is exciting, that you guys are in a process of developing some internships, and I think you said for the summer, correct? You mentioned. Yeah, so um, we plan on having internships that are not really specific. Like a lot of uh, programs will only have internships for the summer. So they only have a, mm -hmm. a summer internship because they're trying to target only students. Um, mm -hmm. Or maybe they only have it for a year because of whatever mm -hmm. um, they need the internship to do. But um, we're planning on having a combination of those. So um, we are looking to offer internship for the spring um, I think it just depends on the proposals right. that we get uh, mm -hmm. internally. Okay. And I'm assuming, and these are just, you know, in-house with DIT. This is not um, in connection with the state of North Carolina internship program, you know, run through the DOA summer internship program. This is completely just standalone through DIT, correct? Right. So we have yeah. uh, historically um, mm -hmm. worked with DOA for those internships. 
Mm -hmm. um, but those are only for the summer. Right. Um, right. And uh, we're looking to um, expand those opportunities. And also, DOA it's kind exciting. of runs it, and right. we're planning on running it ourselves. I think there's a secondary question for, about the remote opportunities. I think that uh, we are looking for at least a hybrid um, because we feel like even though we have a lot of remote workers and we've been successful doing that, when you're first training in a role, um, it's a lot easier to train when you're in person. Um, so I don't know if it will be fully in person, but it will probably be a hybrid situation. Um, and it may ju just depend on the, the particular proposal that we get. There may be some opportunities for fully remote, but I think we're leaning towards it being more hybrid. Great, great. And, super, and very exciting to hear that you guys are um, developing these internships. I, you know, because of the work I do with ETA NC, so excited to hear this because always interested in getting this information out to our campus partners and students because students are always eager to, you know, get involved with our state agencies and learn more about the things that the agencies do and find ways to get engaged. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think another question came through and sharing your email for um, to keep on the list for possible opportunities with these internships. Yeah, just uh, I was trying to grab Perfect. it. No, no, I did see that one. Um, this mm -hmm. is our our service box. Um, so uh, it's not just monitored by me. It's also monitored by my team. So uh, somebody will will receive it and then we can add you to our database. And I have a question and forgive me for all these questions, Sean. Um, when you guys do have these internships ready, would they be posted through NeoGov or just uh, will you guys have them sourced a different way? I think we're looking to do it through NeoGov. Okay. I don't think I it necessarily needs you know. to be connected to a, a position. I think that you can. Yeah. We are going to have uh, some positions internally. Um, so although that sometimes is a, is a limitation with the applic application system, um, I think we're actually going to have positions. So I don't know if that's actually going to be a problem. Yeah, I only ask because I've seen agencies do it various ways. Some agencies will just have um, applicants to send their resume and cover letter to, you know, email to whoever is, right. you know, orchestrating the internship and they'll just handle it like that. And I also seen agencies will run it through NeoGov and operate as if it's a, a job posting, if you will, and, you know, run it like that too. So I always do that just so I can advertise it the right way and inform students how to, you know, submit their application materials. Sure. I think that's what we're leaning towards is posting it in NeoGov. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we haven't actually posted uh, them yet. The ones that we've uh, either done in the past, they've been, we've just been able to connect people with uh, particular uh, opportunities mm -hmm. um, or it's been done through the DOA. Um, so they've been managing that application process. And the most important question that I'm surprised no one has not asked yet, are these paid positions? They will be paid. Yeah, awesome. I think they're um, probably going to be between $15 and $20 an hour. Excellent. Good. It's a nice healthy price, too. It's nice to hear. Competitive. Yeah. It's we good. need to uh, compete. <laughs> yeah, seriously, we do. I know. I tell you, that has been something I've been saying for a while to be at least at the $15 mark. Right. Yeah, that's our that's our um, our floor. And then mm -hmm. um, I think hopefully I agree. we can get up to 20. I agree. 15. I agree. 15 is the floor to compete with private for sure. Awesome. This is amazing. Very exciting. Well, I will admit for a mental note for me, you know, I will check back in at least for my mental note, um, if not late December, early January, to see, you know, if, if it is where um, where you guys in that process is so I can start helping you all uh, get the word out and spread yeah, the word to our campus partners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Help sourcing some really good um, applicants for that. So. Yeah, that would be awesome. Are there, are there any other questions for Sean in reference to uh, DIT? Entry level comment, entry level positions. 
he go through some in general information as far as uh, common majors, whether associate's degrees or bachelor's degrees, level of experience. He did a great so one job. Thing I was going to tell sorry. tell everybody. Um, I'm still sharing my screen. This is a uh, the classification specs website, which is a, a is a public facing website, and whenever you go to the site. Um, and I'll put the link in the in the chat. Let me put it in real quick. Um, you can figure out. Um, let's say let's say that there's an applications. Um, actually, you click on salary grade. All of our salary grades now are under what's called DT. Um, so LG would be legal, and and then MH I think is medical. So um, anytime you see a, a DT um, grade you know that that's a, an IT position. And you can click through on all of these to figure out, you can click on the salary grade to figure out what kind of range of salary it would it would be. But if you click on one of these, like applications technician, it will tell you what we require. So the minimum education experience for this particular position is only a high school with uh, some computer related coursework um, or correct extracurricular computer related experience. So we do have some um, entry level positions. They're typically um, what are called technician. Um, and like there's always like a series. So for um, the application series, there is a technician one and two, and then there's uh, analyst one and two, and then a specialist, and then a manager. Um, so that's typically how it goes. There's network technician, network analyst, network specialist. It's just, it's very similar across all of our series of uh, classes. So you can click on all of these different um, letters and kind of narrow down to the areas that you may be interested in. Um, we also have um, some entry level in the user technician uh, or user support, I should say. Um, so you can take a look at that. Um, also, I want to point out, I don't think I pointed this out before, if it if you see a minimum education experience and it says an equivalent combination of education and experience, um, let's say that it requires a bachelor's degree um, in, a, in an IT field or math or something. If you don't have the degree that it requires, uh, but you have experience that covers the degree, so maybe it says associates and a certain number of years, you just um, associates is a two year degree, so you just add two years of experience to whatever the experience requirement is, and that's what your equivalent combination of education experience would be. Um, so whenever you see something, know that you don't necessarily need an associate's degree in computer science. Like for instance, this degree says associates in IT related field. Um, you could have IT experience plus no degree. And um, because IT, um, is such a rapidly changing field. Um, sometimes a bachelor's degree will actually put you behind because by the time you get through a four-year degree, all the technology you just uh, worked on for four years is outdated. <laughs> so um, sometimes Very assistance true. degrees are, are better because they're more specific um, to the particular field that you're going into. So Very we true. definitely are looking for people with associate's degrees as well. Um, or, you know, you sign up for um, some certificates and boot camps and stuff like that to supplement. Um, th those are always helpful. Thank you for sharing that. That's extremely viable information. If you only knew how many folks get tripped up over that, everything after the colon that says, or equivalent combination education and experience. You know, right. working at OSHR, we get so many questions about that all the time with just the amount of phone calls of folks asking about, well, why did I not qualify for this based off of this line and explain just that one piece right there is it's viable information. So thank you so much for explaining that. Folks, that's definitely like the gold line that what Sean just explained right there of a you know, the fast ticket just to get through the application process. Cause like I mentioned, that is one of the things that folks get confused all the time when they're um, seeing if they even can qualify for a position. So thank you again for explaining that. Sure. And whenever you're reading through any of these postings and you're looking at the requirements and you're looking at the minimum education experience, 
um, really think about whether you actually uh, qualify or not. Um, try to figure out like the things that you've done for in your roles or in school previously. Um, they may be you may not think about them as being uh, relevant, but maybe they are. So really think about it before you decide that you're not qualified and you don't apply. And you don't have That's to be uh, paid. They don't always have to be paid experiences. Right. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. will sign up for uh, volunteer work or let's say you're a software developer. A lot of people, um, they work on open source projects. Um, and that's that would be something that you could put put on there as well, because that's definitely a volunteer thing. Pe people aren't getting paid for open source work typically. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments for Sean? Uh, yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, so. I'm currently in school for a certification uh, program, and I was wondering, does that qualify for internship as well? Yeah, I guess it depends on what, what it is. Um, for the internship, um, we're definitely looking at whether people are qualified or not. It's definitely going to put you at the top of the list. But one of the things that we're looking at internships doing is helping people get the experience that they need so that they can qualify uh, for a full-time gotcha. position. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, definitely don't think that you're not qualified and don't apply um, and try to connect that experience or education um, to whatever the role is saying. Okay, because um, I'm in the IT fundamentals uh, now and I, um, get certified that I'm going to either Network Plus or either uh, security, uh, cyber security. Um, I was definitely looking for an internship for that. So, yeah, so uh, any one of those A plus security or network um, is going to help you get fun, fu your fundamentals down. Um, and those are definitely important for most of our positions. Um, okay. Security Plus would probably help you get into the cybersecurity you know, realm and network and to network and so forth. A Plus is more general, but it would definitely be helpful as well. Okay. Great question. Thank you so much. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there's not any other questions, I will be closing out this session. Sean, thank you so much for your time and sharing a wealth of knowledge with everyone here. Like I mentioned earlier, at the top of the hour, uh, the session is recorded. And so eventually we will have this recorded session on our Ed to NC website. At the close of the session, you will receive an email from me with a very polite request to fill out our survey, asking you for your feedback. This is the first time we are offering these meet and greets in this type of format. So we're testing something new. And we want to know to see if you guys like this format, to see if this is something we should continue to do. So please let us know how you feel about this uh, this, this segment. And if you're interested in attending any, uh, any additional uh, meet and greets throughout this week and next week, the link and QR code will be provided in that email as well. But again, thank you so much for everyone attending today. Thank you, Sean, for being present and letting us know everything about DIT. Again, we appreciate everything that uh, everyone presented and talked about this afternoon and take care. Thank you again. Bye bye now. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Rashawn. And thanks, Clara. And thanks, Naomi. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah.